let's go into more detail about the supernova explosion that happens when you're making a neutron star um, or something bigger. So the kind that I've just been describing in the last video, um, this is what's called a type two supernova. So these type two supernovae, that's why I put the E, yes, uh, that's often the convention for the plural of supernova. Uh, it's called a core collapse. It's what we described. So the key thing here is it's a single star of high mass. Let's compare that to something else called a type 1a. This is a binary star. Okay, so this right here was a single star, high mass star. Let's talk about what happened to it. What happened, of course, this star had so much mass, it was able to uh, collapse and make the supernova because its mass was greater than the Chandrasekhar limit, remember? Uh, because so that means it's uh, bigger than the stable mass of a white dwarf. Now, we don't know exactly what mass it had, though. That's a little bit tough to tell. But what's really key to know is, first of all, so we don't really know the mass. So that's going to be the, another key thing here. Tough to know the mass. Uh, whereas here, we'll know the exact mass. I'll explain that in a second. And the end result, maybe we'll do that in a different color here. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Did I just wreck it? No. So the end result is you get a supernova and a neutron star. And this other one, the end result is still a supernova and a neutron star. So they seem very similar, so who cares? I'll explain why we care. Okay, so everything we did before, we learned about that was a core collapse. Let's compare it now. Okay, so keep in mind, we didn't know its mass. We just knew its final mass was bigger than 1.4, but we don't know what it was exactly. We just know, okay, it had lots of mass. It uh, collapsed, made a neutron star, blew up. The type 1a, however, it's uh, by accretion. It's called the you know vampire star. So first of all, binary star, two stars orbiting each other, just like in this little diagram right here in this drawing. It's not a real picture, but it's an idea of what it could be like. So you have two stars, and you might think, oh, those must be rare. More than half of star systems are actually binary. Single star systems like our own, those are rare. So binaries are actually more common. So we have a binary system, and imagine then there's two stars going around each other. One of them probably dies first. In this case, in the binary star, remember, one of them actually dies, a little bit like what our sun will do. You know, it has a mass less than the Chandrasekhar limit. So because of that, um, it collapses into a white dwarf. So can you imagine then? That's one of the stars right here. That's the white dwarf. So we know it had a mass of less than the 1.4 solar masses, right? We knew that because it was a white dwarf. But what's special about it is this, because they're close to each other, the other star, let's say it's, I don't know, like a red giant, like a big wispy red giant that's trying to hold on to its mass, but it's being spread out. Maybe it's like a planetary nebula, you know, one of these ones that looks really pretty. Some of that material can go out, and because the white dwarf is close to it, that material can be gravitationally attracted to. In other words, it will accrete, it will gain that mass. That's what we call it a vampire star. It's like it sucks the, not the blood, but the mass uh, some of this gas from this, um, in this case, this red giant that's drawn here. So imagine then this, the white dwarf then, which had a mass of less than 1.4 solar masses, it gains mass from the companion until it reaches exactly equal to 1.4. This is actually the special thing. Because we know as soon as it reaches 1.4, it cannot be a stable white dwarf anymore. It's going to collapse and make this supernova explosion and the neutron star. Right? So why do we care? Well, because we know its mass, we can use it as a standard candle. This is the key thing. Because of that, we can use the shape of this curve. It turns out it's not exactly the top of it. It's the shape of the curve. We fit the curves. And by matching the shapes of the curves, we can actually get L. Once we know L, do you remember the magic equation? Uh, we can get it because if we know the apparent brightness, we can we can get that. We can get the apparent brightness of this maximum here. And then if we know luminosity, that means we can get the distance because that's this one right here. So hooray, we can actually get the distance to really far away uh, stars. Let me actually move that equation out of the way for a second right here. Let me just do this because I think it might be. Oh, no, what have I done? I wrecked things here. Nah, come on. All right, well, I'm going to try to move this anyway. I'll see if I can do it. I'll move this stuff right here. You might think, what is he doing? Just bear with me for a second here. I'm just going to move this somewhere else for a second. I'll move this back down because I was having some problems. There we go. So what's really important about this? Come on. There we go. 
I'll move it uh, maybe to here. There we go. So we can get the luminosity from that. We get the distance, and then we're happy because now we can know distances. That's why supernova type 1a are really important. That's why scientists love finding them. We get really excited when we can see them. Here's an example of one. It's supernova 2011 FE. Of course, it happened in 2011. Big surprise. So this nice little diagram. I found it, and I, I like the layout of it. But they did something I don't really like. So they said the death of a star, they said it depends on the size of the star. No, not really. Well, I mean, the size is kind of related, but it's, it's more really because of the mass of the star. So remember, we have this nebula or this, you know, cloud of gas or hydrogen gas. And if it has a low mass like our own sun, it's going to make a star. That star is eventually going to become a red giant, sure. It'll become a planetary nebula like these pretty things that I showed you in previous videos. And eventually it'll die out and make a white dwarf. That's probably like our sun, and that's because the remnant mass, remember, just to make sure, if this gets annoying and you think, oh, I get it, good, because you're going to be asked this. Very often they ask you something about this. So this you get. High mass, it's going to make a red super giant because it's going to get these further levels of this sort of onion uh, ring sort of um, layout of the star where it's going to have lots of different layers. And it's going to get all the way up to iron, and that means it's going to make this supernova, and that means if the remnant mass here is... Um, Let's say between you know 1.5 solar masses and around three solar masses or so, then it's going to do this, right? Neutron star, which is a pulsar, and this here is if the remnant mass is bigger than this. We're not quite sure exactly. It's a little bit fuzzy. These numbers aren't exact. Not these ones. This one is Chandrasekhar one is really clear. These ones are a little bit more sort of fuzzy. But basically, you sort of break space and you make a black hole, and that's the eventual result. But it's because of the mass. Remember, because it's the mass that allows the gravity to push things in. So finally, we have an IB question then. So state what is meant by the Chandrasekhar limit. You could be asked this to actually describe something like this. Uh, maybe I'll just type. It's maybe easier here. So I hope you'll excuse the sounds of the typing. It's probably going to go like clickety-clackety, but there you go. So what could you say about the Chandrasekhar limit? You could say it's the um, maximum mass of a uh, stable white dwarf star. You could say that. That would be one thing you could say. You could say, um, what is it actually? It's when the remnant mass, we'll actually draw that in a second here. We'll put that in a second. We're going to say it's uh, due to electron degeneracy pressure. You could say that if you want. I'm going to leave a space because what I'm going to do, ooh, I needed more space, I guess. Oh, well, good enough. Um, what could we say here? Of course, here we could put in the uh, maximum mass. So we could say, ah, uh, remember, I know this. The mass is less than 1.4. Whoops. Less than 1.4 solar masses. Right? This is the remnant mass, remember. Uh, you could do a similar thing for the Oppenheimer Volkov limit, right? Maybe we'll do it in a different color here. Same sort of idea here. So here I'll say it's the. Try to think what you would say here. It's not the maximum mass of a white dwarf, it's the maximum mass of a neutron star. We could say uh, due to neutron degeneracy pressure. It's never exciting to watch someone type, that's why I'm trying to do it faster here. Just so you don't watch me muddle through stuff here. Um, and of course, we know that the remnant mass, I'm just trying to show you what you could do on an exam, right? You would write these things, of course, by hand. And you'd say the remnant mass is somewhere between, you know, 1.5 solar mass. It's just what we did before. So if it seems repetitive, that's good. I want this to be really deep into your knowledge. So there we go. So what do you think is the fate, then, of a main sequence star whose final mass lies between the Chandrasekhar limit and the Oppenheimer-Volkov limits? What I mean by that is like, you know, less than 3, but bigger than 1.4. What will happen to it? So try to think about that now. Remember what happens? If you're a star whose mass is bigger, the final mass, the remnant mass, is bigger than the uh, Chandrasekhar limit there, this 1.4, but less than the 3, then, of course, I think you know what happens, right? What will happen? Uh, core collapses, you could say. Forms... Uh, neutron star, you could say due to neutron, you, they love when you say this, right? So make sure you mention that's because of the neutron degeneracy pressure. You could say the material uh, falling inwards, sort of bounces 
off the neutron core and uh, scatters out to a supernova explosion. The final result is a neutron or which is also called a pulsar if it's lined up right to us. All right, so you can say something like that. There you go, that's what you could write. So that's how you can solve one of these questions. See, some of these questions are a little bit open-ended, like what is meant by? And they'll usually make it worth two marks because they're really cheap these days with marks. Uh, but basically mention some of this stuff here and you'll be just fine.